what do you have to lose? What's on the line if you have a crisis? What are the what are the what are the worst case scenarios that you can think of? And then based on those worst case scenarios, what can you do now? What can, can you do today to help ensure that those uh, scenarios uh, don't become your nightmare reality uh, tomorrow? If you answer those two, two questions, then I think the answers will lead to what the next steps are. And they should also ask themselves, do I have a crisis management plan in place? Um, if not, how do I get one? If I have it in place, when was it updated last? And then finally, uh, when was it tested to make sure to be it'll work when necessary? Those are the basic questions every CEO uh, should be asking. And if they need help with the answers, um, I'm here to help. Welcome to Straight Talk, where we cut through the BS and get straight into the real conversations with some of the best minds on the planet. I am your host, Af Mahatra. I am blessed to be leading these extraordinary discussions and asking tough questions that then elicit insightful answers, accelerating our awareness of the biggest issues impacting our lives and the future of humanity. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's Af Mahatra here, the host of Straight Talk, I'm delighted to um, be here today for another wonderful show. And this time we have a, uh, a genius author and uh, someone who is uh, who's going to almost uh, there's a, there's almost a, a, a dichotomy in the conversation today. To some extent, it's going to be uh, or, or dual sided. It's going to be something very positive and something very pragmatic and something that every CEO and C-level executive has to should be is thinking about and needs to get better at crisis management, crisis prevention. And of course, the other side is the more sinister side where, God forbid, you have a crisis and you're not prepared and you're not ready and you're not uh, um, resourced well and you haven't thought this through. It can be catastrophic. The crisis can be catastrophic and have major ramifications. And so we have a great author and um, um, gentleman on our show, Edward Siegel. Edward, welcome to Straight Talk. What a pleasure to have you on the show today. Great to be with you. Yeah. And I'm thrilled that you were able to make it on the show. There's so much we need to discuss. I want to just let the audience know, of course, and our audience is pretty smart. So they go off and read a lot. And I'm sure they've done their research. Uh, Edward's book that was published a couple of years back, in fact, in 2020, Crisis Ahead, 101 Ways to Prepare for and Bounce Back from Disasters, Scandals and Other Emergencies. Wow. So uh, it kind of reminds me, as soon as I read that topic, I said this to Edward, years ago, um, when I came into this world of entrepreneurship, I figured out it's it's really very hard. And I came up with this term, make friends with uncertainty. And it was almost my uh, survival. It was like my life jacket term to try and just accept that there's going to be crisis wherever I go. And it's like a default part of, of being in entrepreneurship. Because, you know, you've got all these... Um, curveballs coming at you, the best thing you could do is scenario plan, think ahead a little bit, get some great mentors and coaches. You know, a lot of people don't talk about external intervention because sometimes you don't have the answers. You do need to go to experts who, who do and do this for a living. And Edward is just one of those, um, you know, a very uh, sort of equipped and um, wise individuals. And I'm going to pick his brain on a lot of things. But before I do so, and I said this to Edward, that, you know, straight talk is we meander and we go into alleyways and it's what comes to me naturally. But the first question I would really like to pose at you is beyond the book. And, and it's to do with you really, because to write about crisis situations takes a, a certain type of uh, mindset uh, and a certain type of uh, thinking hat and a lot of experience in life um, because it, it's got its side, the sinister side, and it's got its positive side when you actually do a good job of preventing a crisis. So tell us a little bit about the story um, that is Edwards. What do we need to know about you? Who are you? Uh, how did this all happen? T a bit about your background uh, and take your time, you know, because it's an important story. And then once we do that, then we can jump into the mm -hmm. book and other very interesting things that you write about. Of course, you write for the Forbes as well, right? So that's a very important element. So over to you, the balls in your court for now. Great. Thanks. Well, uh, I have a very checkered background. Uh, it covers the wide uh, spectrum of industries and professions. Um, I was a uh, political science major in college, and I guess I was a frustrated political science major in college. 
because I was getting all this knowledge, but I wanted to put it uh, put it to use. So um, I decided to make a bet with one of my political science professors that I would run for student body president and put what I was learning in class in in, in practice in the field. And if I won the student body president, uh, then I would get an A. And if I didn't, I would get an F. I got the A and I was a student body president for a year. And that's really what turned me on to, to politics and led to my first career, which was uh, working for members of Congress, both Democrats and Republicans. I was an equal opportunity uh, uh, person and played uh, played for both sides, uh, not, 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 not because of my ideology, but because of my interest in politics and using politics to make things better and communicating with people. Uh, so I went to Washington, D.C. I worked as a press secretary and legislative assistant uh, for several years uh, for members of Congress on both sides of the aisle. And that uh, really transitioned to a my second career, which was in public relations. And I did PR work for major advertising and PR firms in Washington, D.C. Uh, went off on my own for a few years uh, uh, as, a, uh, as an independent uh, consultant. And uh, between what I was working for with the uh, PR agencies and my own, I worked for major companies um, such as Ford, uh, Marriott, uh, Humana, and a lot of major trade associations in, in the plastics industry uh, and real estate um, and other professions. And along the way, some of my clients uh, got into trouble. Uh, right. they, they had crisis situations. And that was really for my first exposure uh, to crisis management and crisis communications. And then I found the trend was I'm getting, I was getting more people who are having problems who needed more of my help for crisis management and crisis communications. So I put my other PR work on the back burner and focused more on crisis management, uh, training people to do a good job when they're making presentations and, and speaking to the media. And that led to my other career um, as a writer. Um, I was uh, I worked for a couple of years for uh, for the Wall Street Journal's StartupJournal.com as our marketing right. strategies columnist. Uh, that led to my book, my first book, uh, getting her fifteen minutes of fame, and that led to another career of writing. So fast forward, and for the last several years, I have focused on uh, journalism, uh, public relations, and crisis management. I'm now a uh, senior uh, uh, leadership uh, st uh, contributor. Uh, for uh, for Forbes.com, where I cover almost on a daily basis uh, crisis-related news topics and issues. And my first book, my, my third book came out a couple years ago that you were kind enough to mention, uh, Crisis Ahead. So between the book, uh, my, my consulting business, my training business, and my work for Forbes, uh, I've got a very full plate. Wow. Okay. So um, that is that is a beautiful background, very rich, and I can see the connect the connections from the politics to um, the, the the final expression of what you've learned through that time in, in writing. And then of course the, the PR and comms. And I guess once you're immersed in in this in this zone, it's very, very hard to, and I, I'm taking a guess, it's very hard to detach yourself from uh, the goings on in the world today, especially on where we where we are. And I want to I want to go into that pathway for a second, but I want to ask you really uh, uh, just playing on my mind. You know, they say doctors are the, the, the worst when it comes to treating themselves. Builders are the worst um, in terms of doing up their homes because you go to their homes and it looks like a building site. Um, do you tend to be good at uh, applying your models and your techniques during your personal or career crisis situations? Are you one of those exceptions to the rule or does it go out of the window? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> okay. um, I know what I don't know. I know what my strengths are. I know what I'm good at. I know what I enjoy doing. But sometimes it's really important, no matter how good you think you are or how good you've proven you are, sometimes the best thing to do is to ask for another opinion um, or a consultant and, and get a second opinion and advice. And that's exactly what I did uh, when my uh, my book, Crisis Ahead, came out. Uh, while I have a background in uh in in public relations and marketing, I decided um, I wanted to hire people who knew exactly how to promote and market a book because that's mm -hmm. its whole different discipline. So I interviewed a lot of PR firms that specialize in book publicity and wound up hiring a great firm called Smith Publicity, and they did an outstanding job of promoting my book. 
And I really enjoyed the fact that I did not have to get the work. They did the work to get the interviews. Uh, my job was to uh, good, give good interviews and to talk about um, the book and my areas of expertise. Um, and I would not hesitate that if I write another book uh, to hire them or another another firm uh, to do the work so I can focus in on uh, promoting the book and uh, turn it over to other experts whose judgment and uh, talent I trust um, and let them do the work for me. Mm, great, fantastic. And that's really it's a really important point because it reminds me of uh, this whole area. In fact, Daniel Kahneman uh, many, many years ago wrote this uh, interesting, in fact, it was an HBR article was in response to, I think, the 2008 crisis. I think it was, you know, when decision-making was all over the place and greed was taking over and, you know, ego and groupthink and so on. And I think he summed it up and he said, look, when you make these decisions, they're kind of for, for um, faculties that you should use to make these decisions. It could be experience, uh, depending on if you've got some experience in that domain. Uh, and it could, this is going to go back to what you do really well, by the way, uh, in terms of guidance to CEOs. So experience is one. The second area is a data or metrics, you know, evidence, basically, uh, that you rely on. The third area is gut instinct. And the fourth one is external perspective. And um, I think why I'm stating that is because let's go back to crisis ahead and everything that you write about. Um, it is, uh, we, we live in unprecedented, frenet frenetic, crazy, uh, unpredictable, uncertain times. You know, VUCA on steroids, if you want to call it that. Um, tell me, um, where your head is at today. And I know I don't want to spend too much time on COVID because it's kind of done and dusted for now. Um, because I know I've seen a lot of your interviews during that time and I, I you know, valued a lot of your responses because there was a certain uh, phase we were going through. Um, and we, we are now a byproduct of that phase because a lot's changed in society. But with war, with the Ukraine situation, with geopolitical unrest, with inflation, with the um, you know overabundance uh, injection of money into the the the, the um, stock market and on and on energy crisis and the list goes on and on. Tell me how a you look at this, and then my question B, which we'll spend more time on, is uh, trying to figure try to figure out how CEOs need to be looking at this because of course not everyone's an expert on the CEO side and not everyone can hire you. I guess they can, but uh, um, firstly, how are you now processing this madness around us? Uh, how, what do you think about it? That's a great question. I try to filter all the crises, all the disasters, all the scandals, all the corporate emergencies. I look at them with uh, with, with, an, with a, as much objectivity as I can about what's mm -hmm. happening, uh, where it's happening, and how it's happening, uh, and why it's happening. And I ask myself two questions when I decide uh, to write about uh, a crisis uh, for, for Forbes.com, for example. The two questions are, who cares? <laughs> yeah. And the other question is, why? Why do people care? Why should they care? And what's the impact of, of that crisis? Uh, yeah. Some crises are having a greater impact uh, on people than, than others. Uh, for example, what's, uh, what's happening uh, uh, to Twitter and how uh, Elon Musk um, is essentially uh, driving that company into the ground uh how is that affecting people well it's not affecting anyone more than people who are on twitter on one on one level but it's affecting a lot of people because of the ripple effects and the the the, the large shadow or footprint that elon musk and and twitter uh casts so i follow that uh very closely and have written about that several articles for forbes.com um mm -hmm. another crisis is what's happening in the uk uh, mm -hmm. How Buckingham Palace is responding uh, to the new uh, Netflix uh, series about mm -hmm. uh, Prince Harry and uh, and his wife. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, I saw this, the first story I saw this morning said that Buckingham Palace said they are not going to comment um, on 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 the documentary or or what what's being said uh, about the royal family. Now that does not affect a lot of people. But yeah. it's an interesting crisis to follow from what you can learn um, and the, I guess, the titillation factor. Uh, the people around the world are fascinated with the royals. And so that's as much, uh, you know, gossip and celebrity journalism as it is uh, a real crisis. But whether it's affecting a lot of people or few people or no people, um, if it's in the news, if it's making headlines, um, I'm following it very closely and trying to find out what are the most important lessons 
uh, business leaders, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, influencers? What can they learn from how well or poorly um, others are responding to a crisis so they don't make those mistakes themselves and they could uh, put uh, uh, put the lessons to use uh, when they have their own crisis? Mm. Mm. It's interesting you mentioned that. Um, one of the things you talk about in your book, and I, I love this, you have you have different frameworks, and w- one of the frameworks has um, a component in it which is about the admission of responsibility, um, showing vulnerability to say, "Look, I made a mistake. I screwed up as a leader." And um, most recently in the startup world, it's interesting because I come from that world. We've noticed a lot of CEOs who are either shutting companies down or firing a whole bunch of people who are actually openly using that component and saying, Hey, I screwed up. And, you know, of course the world says, sees that as, Oh my God, wow, you're so courageous. And um, you're demonstrating vulnerability. And uh, I really feel for you. I mean, this, this is great. I love the fact that you're open and you're honest and so on and so forth, but to some extent it almost feels like a formula. It's happening so often now I'm I'm trying to figure out whether it's a get out of jail free card or it's like, well, I've screwed up. Let's just say I swallow my pride and just say, I, you know, my mistake. Uh, I, uh, let me, let me throw this at you. When a model or a framework is developed to deal with the situation, does it run the risk of becoming so standardized and so predictable that the authenticity in response gets diluted? I don't think it's a formula and following basic rules, best practices, uh, for managing or responding to to a crisis, I think that's important uh, for every company and organization because there are basic rules of the road that are very important to help uh, prevent a company from getting into trouble or to help them get out of trouble as soon as possible. But yeah. I think what you touch on is very important. It's the sincerity factor. How sincere are they? Um, and the public can have a very fine-tuned, sensitive antenna when it comes to uh, detecting how sincere or insincere an individual, a company, a CEO is um, when uh, when they express themselves. There have been crises in Japan where when the CEO goes out to apologize, they're actually crying. You can see the tears coming down their face. They bow, they, they apologize, they get choked up, they get very emotional. Uh, they actually, some of them have been no, known to, uh, uh, to try on camera. Um, mm-hmm. I can't think of an American CEO that has actually cried on camera because of uh, when they apologize for something they or their company did. But I think yeah. when uh, part of the way of, of determining how sincere a company or a CEO is yeah. about responding to a crisis is first, how quickly do they respond to the crisis? How quickly do they say or do something about it? Um, Adidas is a great example where they took several weeks, perhaps even about a month, uh, before they came out and uh, distanced themselves and terminated their relationship with uh, with Kanye West uh, because of the anti-Semitic and racist things he had been saying. Mm-hmm. A lot of people did not think Adidas was sincere because they waited so long to, uh, to come out and say something uh, about the crisis. So I think the speed at which a company or a CEO apologizes, um, that's... Uh, that's the first indicator. Another indicator is how are they positioning that apology? Some companies and politicians and CEOs will issue what's called the non-apology apology. And that usually sounds like this. I'm sorry if you were offended by anything I said or did. Well, that's not an apology. <laughs> the apology is yeah. I'm sorry for what I did. I'm sorry for what our company created this crisis. I'm sorry because, and immediately after that, they have to express remorse and explain exactly what they did wrong, why they did it, and uh, the steps that they're taking to make sure that they don't repeat that uh, mistake again. If they follow that formula, and yes, it is a formula, and if they're sincere and it's timely, um, then I think the public can be very understanding and very quick to apologize. But as the longer a company or CEO waits to apologize, uh, the, the the easier it'll be for the public to think, um, you know, they don't mean it, they don't care, and when they finally get around to apologizing, it they'll say, well, they waited so long, so they probably were not that serious about it. So speed is really important uh, in uh, in uh, in trying to get back on track and apologize and get back into good graces with the people you offended uh, or were affected by your crisis. 
Yeah. What delays? Uh, it makes a lot of sense. What what causes the delay then? What, why don't uh, companies respond back as quickly as they should? Well, it can be denial. They say, no, this is not happening. It can't possibly be happening. Uh, we're just going to ignore it because we don't think it's true. Um, another another factor in creating the delay is that uh, the company or the CEO might have to go through various layers or bureaucracy or red tape uh, at their company or organization. Uh, perhaps they need to consult with their lawyers or HR people, depending upon the crisis. Then they might have to take it to the board of directors or the executive committee. They might have multiple layers within their company or organization that they have to have uh, uh, people sign off on before they can uh, say or do anything. And depending upon the industry or profession, uh, they might have to consult with their vendors. They might have to consult with, with other people who could be affected or the stockholders or investors. But all of those things, as understandable as it is, uh, if they take too long uh, checking with, with these people, uh, then that builds into the delay that will create uh, doubt, confusion, um, and cynicism when they uh, finally get around to apologizing it. So I'm fine if uh, speed is important, if you have to touch base, but uh, that's one of the things I talk about in my book. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't wait until you have a crisis to figure out who has to approve your response when you have a crisis. Get all that figured mm -hmm. out now. So uh, when, not if your company has a crisis, uh, you'll know how quickly you can uh, move ahead, who you have to talk to, and how to get those approvals. And that's another reason why uh, people should practice their responses to the cri to a crisis before there's a crisis, to make sure they can handle things, they have a plan in place, and they'll have a speedy response uh, when they do have a crisis. Yeah. the the It's interesting because I guess you've been guiding and advising executives on this for many, many years. Um what I'm interested in is your observations on the current and the future generation of leaders. Because, of course, demographics are changing globally, all right? Um, you could go to the East uh, and go to India, China. You could go to Europe, UK, the US. You, you're starting to see a shift in the, the type of leaders you see today than you did 20, 25 years ago or even less. I'm sure you see that. Um, there's another element to that, though. So one is the demographic change. The other is the technological change in terms of social media. The source of crises now, uh, as in like what could go wrong uh, with the virt virtual world that we live in, uh, is, um, I can't think of any other word but a, a Gen Z word, insane, uh, insane um, which is just madness. And it's uncontrollable. I mean, you could screw up from, you know, a local Starbucks where someone tweets that, you know, gosh, you know, the, the guy who was serving me is, is uh, discriminating against me. And it could just happen literally in milliseconds on Twitter and it could be blown out of a proportion. Mm. And of course, you've got to quickly respond to it and react to it and so on. So tell, tell me a little bit about where, you, with all these years of experience, what are the big shifts you're seeing in the, the typical executive from yesteryears to today? And then, of course, then the, uh, the role of social media. How's that uh, causing greater complexity or uncertainty in the work that you do? Well, I think CEOs uh, today are much more uh, aware uh, of the importance of being prepared for a crisis than than, uh, than previous generations, because they know there's right. so much at stake. And they know, as you just touched on, uh, the impact of social media, that uh, you know before they can get up and get a second cup of coffee, <laughs> someone's tweeted <laughs> something and it's all over the world. And yeah. it's really important. Uh, that they have uh, someone who's monitoring uh, all the social media platforms around the clock uh, to make sure that uh, if when someone says something uh, negative uh, on social media, uh, that uh, they have a process and procedures in place that they can respond to it as as soon as possible. Uh, what's yeah. good about the new generation and generations that are coming up, uh, the leadership ladder, uh, they're much more comfortable um, with with technology, and it's second nature to them. Digital natives, I believe, is is how they're mm. they're referred to. They grew up, they were born. It's uh, it's second nature uh, to them. So that's good. That means it's they have a better understanding about how to use technology. They understand the impact that can that uh, technology uh, can have. But there's some things that are remain the same I've seen over the years, and I've been doing this more than 30 years, where things don't change. Uh, the tendency by CEOs to put off a decision, uh, to check with someone else before 
uh, they make a, a hard or difficult uh, decision. Uh, building into a, a response to a crisis uh, for a delay. So that's really uh, important that uh, to overcome that. And that's why I advocate for my book. I advocate in my 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 my, my training sessions and my consulting for for clients. I tell yeah. them, don't wait until there, there's a crisis to figure out what you're going to do about it. Have a crisis management and plan in place. Um, have your team in place. We could talk more about that. But uh, that makes the process go a lot easier. It gives uh, CEOs a comfort level, knowing there's a, a plan in place for when there's a crisis, and uh, that helps uh, to ensure a faster, more uh, more timely response when they do have a disaster, a scandal, or other corporate emergency. Mm. Do you find the the digital native equivalents? I'm sure you work with uh, that demographic as well. Do you find them uh, to be uh, more competent or more able to deal with certain situations? Um, from a uh, psychological stress management standpoint, um, better or differently from from past years, uh, do you, do you see any major differences there? You know, are they able to deal with the calamities and the potential catastrophes better, or do you see them freaking out? And you believe uh, actually they're a little bit wet behind the ears. What, what's your general sort of observation? I found it's not a matter of age or generation; it's a matter of their personality um, and their education and their experience or their their life experiences um you know i've 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 worked with some some folks in their 20s and their 30s who have more common sense uh, and 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 more life experience than someone uh, double or triple their age mm -hmm. so it really depends on the, on on the individual their background their personality uh not necessarily when the, what they where they went to school but what they learned no matter where they went to school and how they're putting that education uh, to to the test, and how they're using their life experiences for whether the company or organization um, they start or they or they join. But it really gets back down to training. I've trained a lot of people, a lot of different age groups, a lot of different generations, and without fail, they all do better once they have been trained on how to deal with the media, how to uh, give right. a good presentation to any audience. How to respond to a crisis, how to have a plan in place. Uh, when I put them through the training, no matter what age group they are, uh, they all do a lot better. So the, the training and the practice um, and the preparation um, is absolutely key, no matter what age you are or what position you have in a company. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Yeah, I think that's super important. And I guess a lot of C level executives, you know, I remember going through some media training in one of my roles. Uh, again, that also, it really depends on who trains you, right? I um, mean, I've had two or three different flavors of this. I remember one was awful and one was incredible. And uh, I was kind of confused And because the first time I got it done, I thought, oh my God, this is awful. And then I thought, is this what media training is all about? And then in another incarnation, I got some more training and that was brilliant. And so I think it depends on, it's horses for courses, as they say. So you've got to be very careful about whether you're going to get an Edward Siegel or you're going to get Joe Bloggs, right, um, <laughs> at the end of the day. Uh, so let, let's go into the book for a moment. Tell me a bit about, you know, you talked about who cares, why, and the impact. So uh, what, what compelled you to write this book and, and why in 2020? Um, who was it for? Why? And uh, what impact do you, did you think it's going to make? I'm just trying to you, use your own... Um, your own sort of three questions on trying to better understand uh, the, the logic behind the book and the timing. Well, I wrote the book because I wanted to share uh, my knowledge, my expertise, and the lessons that I've learned counseling yeah. others on how to prevent or manage a crisis. I wanted to share that with a with a broader audience. And also, I wanted to use the book as a way to help um, educate readers on what the steps they can uh, take to prevent a crisis so they don't have to deal with that situation. And also importantly, about a third, more than a third of the book um, are many case studies with more than 100 different crisis triggers that I've identified on how a company or organization or high profile individual, how they responded to that crisis and what others can learn from how well or sometimes how poorly they responded uh, to, to the crisis. Uh, so it's a matter of education and training and, and preparation. That's, that's why I, uh, I wrote the book. And it yeah. was a great experience because I had the opportunity uh, to uh, uh, put into words uh, for a much larger audience 
um, a lot of the training that I had done and the advice and counsel um, I I had provided. Um, I, I wrote the book in uh, 2019. It takes a year about to to write a book and another another year to go through uh, the the publishing process. And the book was actually scheduled to come out in uh, the summer of 2020, uh, but that was before COVID hit. When mm-hmm. COVID hit, um, the the publisher uh, for a variety of reasons they wanted to change the title of the book from what it had been to what it is now, uh, mm-hmm. Crisis Ahead. They wanted to have a more of an evergreen. Uh, title for the book. And because of COVID, they actually asked me to rewrite the introduction of the, of the book um, to address the lessons that were being learned at that time uh, from, yeah. from the COVID crisis. And then they destroyed all the copies of the, uh, f- of the first edition of the book. They destroyed all of the copies and then printed thousands of copies of the new book with a new title and the new introduction. And they speeded up the pr- production of the book and the ebook came out in uh, in April of 2020. Uh, hit the market; it was very well received. And then the print uh, edition came out um, in June. It soon became a uh, uh, one of the, the hot new releases on Amazon, um, and a lot of, got a lot of good interviews and uh, a lot of lot of good exposure. So uh, the book has been doing very well. It was actually named one of the best books in crisis management uh, by one of the book review organizations and favorably reviewed and was the number one bestseller on Amazon um, in uh, in several categories. So it's available now as a uh, continues to be available as an ebook and as a uh, uh, print print edition. Um, but I'm always updating uh, what I've learned and uh, writing now for Forbes.com for the latest examples of how well or poorly uh, companies or organizations are uh, responding to a crisis. Mm, Beautiful. And very quickly, a quick plug in, because for all of our straight talkers who'd like to get hold of the book, um, Edward has kindly um, given us a very generous um, reduction on the the base price for the ebook. And I'll be posting that on social. And uh, so jump on and avail of that offer. It's a no brainer. But if you do want to buy the, the, the is it a soft, is softback? It's a paperback, right? The, the book and a hardback or both? It's available in paperback um, and the ebook. Um, and it's my publisher, Nicholas Brealey, um, that was uh, generous enough to uh, provide that 50% discount for, for the ebook. So I want to thank them for, for doing that for your, for your audience. That's terrific. And we can do that on Amazon, correct? Yeah. Uh, it's a special code you need that I think you could share with your uh, with your audience uh, to yeah. get the 50% yeah. off the ebook, uh, or they can buy, buy it straight away without that discount. I'm on Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, uh, independent bookstores, uh, wherever they buy their books, uh, the book is available uh, for purchase there as well. Excellent. Great. You, you wouldn't know if it's on Audible, would you? If it's uh, there's an audio yeah. version of the book as yet? Not yet. Okay. All right. Great. Because many of our, because we're podcast listeners, many people like to listen to Audible as well, but that's again, something that I'm sure you'll consider down the line. So I, uh, um, I, I do cover some of my, some of the strategies and tactics that I cover in the book. I have a, what I, a, a mini podcast uh, okay. called the crisis management minute. Um, that's available on Spotify okay. um, and uh, uh, Apple podcasts. And a lot of what I talk about in the book for strategies and tactics and techniques, um, I talk about that on a weekly basis on the uh, Crisis Management Minute podcast. Awesome. Great. We'll get we'll get all that information to all of our viewers when we publish the episode, of course, in the description on the YouTube um, uh, show and on social media um, and, and so on. So that's fantastic. Uh, we're going to switch gears and we're going to go into uh, some of the more recent stuff that you've been writing about in the Forbes. And of course, there may be a numerous things playing in your mind right now. Earlier on, you said, I've got to filter out and decide uh, what I write about, because of course I can write about so many things. And then, you know, the who cares why and impact is an important sort of barometer or get, you know, um, gauge for you. So uh, given where we are, I mean, you talked about some of the things that are going on with the, the UK uh, royal family situation, the Harry Meghan episode. You talked about uh, events that are going on around us, and you're, you know, watching over them diligently, and you're trying to figure out how people respond to these situations. Tell us a little bit about um, uh, wh- what are those big sort of um, hairy, scary, 
uh, crisis situations that are either happening now that you you're pretty pretty much you know you have your head in your hands thinking oh my god you know um, how is how is this person managing the situation i mean that's a it's a it's a train crash um, and, and or anything related to that where you believe it is a badly managed uh, crisis situation because let's talk about that too as well, as much as we talk about the things you can do to avoid this where does it go wrong well um, the worst crisis the worst way to manage a crisis is what elon musk is doing uh, okay. to uh, to twitter um, he's taken a good respected uh, company that okay wasn't perfect it had its problems but everything he said everything that he's done since he bought the company not only has he created a crisis at the company he's actually made things worse and there's a lot of speculation that the site might actually crash and burn and and go away mm -hmm. uh, because how he has uh, managed uh, or mismanaged um, the 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 company so that that's a, 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 a the train wreck that's still in progress uh a crisis that is still yet to be determined and you can't get big, much bigger than the climate crisis is the climate crisis and that's a crisis that affects all of us no matter where we live or what we do uh, or mad, no matter what we think about it you don't have to agree that there's a climate crisis in order to be affected by the climate crisis you know years ago people were in denial that there's, there was a climate crisis. Now it's pretty well understood and accepted that, yes, we do have a climate crisis. The question is, what are we going to do about it? Some mm -hmm. some uh, some companies are being you know taking a leadership uh, role by uh, reducing uh, the uh, their carbon uh, footprint, uh, doing what they can to limit uh, or reduce their impact on the environment. Um, Amazon uh, just the other day. Uh, announced that they are, uh, have a fleet of uh, uh, environmentally friendly uh, electric vehicles that they're using around the country uh, uh, to deliver items to people. So it, that you know that's that's a good example of a company that's trying to do the right thing uh, about 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 a crisis. Mm. But because this is a global crisis, some companies are doing some countries are doing a better job than others right. uh, to address the climate to reduce pollution to do what they can to uh, regulate uh, industries uh, that are polluting the atmosphere. So that's uh, the jury is still out as to whether or not we're going to survive the crisis, whether individuals and companies and entire countries are going nice. to do the right thing to, to address the crisis. So uh, that's to be determined. Yeah. Do you, do you think, uh, again, playing in my mind, do you think the, the different sort of shapes and sizes of different crisis situations that are here or expected to come our way um, for different for different organizations you know in the, in the public sector you've got a whole different set of crises to manage uh, politically you've got um, on the pol pol politics side you've got a, a whole you know a cadre and then workplace enterprises have their own and, and so on and so forth do you think the um, sort of slightly provocative question do you think over a period of time when you can categorize and I, i'm making a gross assumption but you can correct me if i'm wrong that we can start to categorize or label or organize or put into some sort of a framework the different types of responses to different types of crises and you know with with its subcategorization right if, if one has to do that i'm sure it's been done in the past do you think the role of machines and ai uh, in giving at least the early responses. It could be uh, email-based responses, audio responses, mass communication to a group of um, followers on social media or you know, employees in, a, in a, an organization. Do you think that sometimes would be, if Elon had an a AI-driven crisis management uh, solution that could neutralize some of his behaviors, um, maybe he would be better off. But do you, do you believe the future of crisis management, you know, when, uh, I don't know how many more people do this and how, how many more people practice this over the next 15, 20, 25 years at a human level. Um, but I always think, because I'm a technologist, how can AI help to make something better? Not to replace the, the human being and the expert, but how does AI help to make something a little bit better? Have you thought about the role of technology in streamlining crisis management or at least responses and comms in that space? Well, so far, the examples that I've seen in the news 
uh, AI and other technology had been more responsible for creating a crisis right, than, okay. than for, for dealing with a crisis or creating a bad situation or an embarrassing situation. Yeah, and the old yeah. saying that garbage in, garbage out really mm. applies. Mm. Uh, what, how, how you build those algorithms or how you build a technology, that's really going to affect um, how that technology is going to work and whether it's going to work uh, for you um, or against you. Um, I remember a few years ago when they had the f horrible fire at uh, the Notre Dame uh, Cathedral um, in Paris, uh, one of the news networks uh, was doing a live feed, and because of an algorithm that they were using, there was a crawler or graphic on the screen e equating the fire at uh, Notre Dame with the planes crashing into the World Trade Center for 9-11, which of course wasn't true. Uh, there was no was comparison. Uh, and 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 the news organization was embarrassed. They had to take down the uh, the algorithm, and they had to issue a uh, a correction. So that's a good example of how uh, technology can uh, can get you into trouble. Mm. Whether it can uh, prevent you getting into trouble, I think that really uh, remains to be seen, because most a lot of crisis situations are caused by people, and it really requires people uh, to be aware of the situation and to use best practices in managing and responding and uh, recovering from a crisis. That said, technology can be used very effectively by people when they deal with a crisis. For example, uh, a CEO uh, puts out a, a, a video on YouTube um, mm -hmm. with a comment about uh, the crisis and what they're doing to, to address it. Or they use any of the uh, social media platforms to get the word out and communicate with their target audiences or direct messaging uh, or, you know, websites, all of those things that we're all familiar with. If they can use or their staff can use or their consultants can use that kind of technology uh, to help communicate with people about what that company or individual is doing about that crisis, um, that's a good way to use AI algorithms and everything else uh, to get the word out uh, in a timely and effective manner. But whether it, an AI can help uh, prevent a crisis, um, only time will tell and see how that technology evolves. Yeah. Okay. Fair play. There's something called GPT. Um, it's open AI based technology. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but GPT chat just came out about um, a week ago. And in five days, it's it's got a million followers. It's one of the most advanced AI driven chat systems where you're asking it quite complex questions. Uh, for example, uh, how does one manage a political crisis? And it comes up with a pretty impressive answer. Do play around with it. It's on a waiting list now, uh, but but it's it's part of the open AI technology. And I think, you know, you are right. I think uh, AI can, and bad algorithms can cause uh, a chaos and mess. But actually equally in the future, uh, not everyone will have the ability to, in, in, a, in a split response. I'm assuming that the types of crises are going to change and are they going to be small ones, little ones, baby ones, big ones? Uh, and, and many of us will have to deal with them more regularly. As in the old days, it was just one executive team. Maybe now, uh, like in a startup, you know, it's, it's open. A startup is open at every level. It's flat structure. It's all on social media. Heck, they're thinking of this concept of the metaverse. I don't, I can't even think about how one would manage crisis in the metaverse where you have the physical verse and then you have, you have, you have the social media verse and then you have this metaverse and there are calamities and crises happening there all the time. Who knows how we're going to deal with that there, but it, it feels like, um, uh, it feels like this blend of understanding politics, like with you understanding PR cons and understanding sensitivity of communication, and then wrapping that up into how big companies can actually keep everyone on side because you are going to screw up at some point you know, in, intentionally or unintentionally. Um, it feels like it's it's a necessary, it's a necessary training and it's a necessary investment every executive needs to make. I mean, I think, I remember in the old days, it was very much, and my training came out of big companies, but I'm now thinking, uh, right, Edward, I'm thinking, I don't know if you do this, but if you think of the next generation of companies that are going to be big companies, that's, they are often technology companies. And, you know, you look at the East, you look at India, it's now the third largest a startup tech ecosystem, then you've got the America being right at the top, China there as well, UK and so on. And we have thousands and thousands and thousands of fintechs and reg techs and media techs and all sorts of tech companies and CEOs, mostly inexperienced CEOs, first time CEOs, who without question are screwing up today in terms of their PR, without question. 
And they have no knowledge. And actually, I would even argue that the training that you provide, I think a lot of them don't even know that they, they don't know what they don't know, actually. They don't know what they don't know. And I wonder, as I listen to you, and I'm not trying to give you more work, because of course you're, you've been doing this for so long, but I do think, I think ahead in terms of pragmatism and solving problems, what you're doing is equally applicable to the next generation of CEO of a technology startup as it is to Elon. Uh, because and we have to remember that group has no understanding of what you're talking about. Uh, they, have, they don't actually go on media training until and unless some VC gives them 20 million bucks, 30 million bucks, and they can afford the media training. So I wonder if there's a whole domain that's not been touched on, look, you've all got to deal with crisis situations. Do it properly, will you? And here is a format or here are the things you need to consider. I guess your book is the, the first starting point, no? I, almost mandating that book for every CEO of a tech company. That's what I'm saying, I guess, today. Yeah, that's my uh, my book is about a 350-page business card <laughs> for me. <laughs> where, uh, yeah. where I share my advice, I share my expertise. Uh, but yeah. ironically, a lot of people who read the book, they'll say, this is great. He knows what he's talking about, but I don't want to do it. I'm going to hire him. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, okay. he, he has good good advice on on how to deal with the, the media, but I want I want him to show me exactly. Yeah. I want to learn yeah. directly from him. You know, yeah. some people yeah. do a good job learning from books. Others learning from video. Other yeah. people need to have that that experience. Um, so I'm an all of the above kind of guy. Uh, that's why I wrote the book. I do in-person and uh, virtual uh, uh, Zoom Zoom training for for companies and organizations. I do one-on-one -on -one counseling, yeah. Um, yeah. but importantly, you're you're right. You know, every year we have a lot of people who are starting a business uh, from scratch uh, or taking over an existing business, and most of them have no experience dealing with the media, dealing with public relations, or even preparing or knowing what the consequence. Um, of a crisis is going to be until it happens to them, until they realize that it's their bottom line, um, their profits, their image, their reputation, the morale of their their staff. Those are can all be affected uh, by a crisis. And I've been brought in by by some companies where I was able to help help them turn things around, uh, get them back on track. Um, others, unfortunately, they came to me too late or they were in denial too long, and there was simply no help. For them and they they or their company uh went 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 under so that's another value of uh, crisis management planning that i share with my clients uh, think of it as a insurance policy as a health health insurance policy you hope you never have to use your health insurance but when you get sick or you need an operation you're very glad it's there that's well right. that's that's how people should look at uh, crisis management planning you hope you never have to use that plan but you're going to be very happy it's there for when you do have that crisis. Mm. So whether they follow my advice in my book or listen to my podcast or read my articles on Forbes.com or they want to uh, bring me in to help train them or their staff, um, they need the training, they need the, they need the education, uh, they need that insurance policy, and uh, I'm here to help them do that uh, no matter uh, what level or, or how they want to get that advice. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. That's wonderful. Uh, you know, today has been a fantastic learning for me because I think you've opened my eyes to the, the things that stay the same when it comes to crisis management. Because, of course, there's this thought in your mind that, you know, a crisis is different now. There's so many more. There's so many shapes and sizes. There's so many incarnations. Surely the whole practice has changed, transformed, in fact. But I think what you're saying today is, there's an element of that augmentation. That's the only natural, the evolution of how one looks at crisis and manages the, uh, the, a difficult situation in a crisis. But then, of course, there are stu there's stuff that is, um, you know, evergreen to a large extent uh, that I guess you have in your book. Uh, before we close off, I just wanted to sort of ask you, um, with, with a bit of a Harry Potter um, wand in your hand, if, if, if I may, if you were to guide anyone today right now on the one thing they can do, I know you talked about speed and, and so on and so forth, but even before that, what's the one thing you would say to, let's say, let me define it, uh, an aspiring or a new CEO um, of a technology business, let's make it that specific. What's the one thing you would say to them right now in 20, 30 seconds? So you, they a little bit more prepared for tomorrow. God forbid a crisis is coming tomorrow. You know it is coming with your Harry Potter 
uh, vision. Uh, what's that magic one thing you would do right now for, for that CEO? What would you say to them? What would you do to them to help them be ready for tomorrow? I would ask them, what do you have to lose? What's on the line if you have a crisis? What are the, what are the, what are the worst case scenarios that you can think of? And then based on those worst case scenarios, what can you do now? What can you do today to help ensure that those uh, scenarios uh, don't become your nightmare reality uh, tomorrow? Mm -hmm. If you answer those two questions, then I think the answers will lead to what the next steps are. Mm -hmm. And they should also ask themselves, do I have a crisis management plan in place? Mm -hmm. um, if not, uh, how do I get one? If I have it in place, when was it updated last? And then finally, uh, when was it tested to make sure to be it'll work when necessary? Those are the basic questions every CEO uh, should be asking. And if they need help with the answers, um, I'm here to help. Beautiful. I uh, love that. It's been a real pleasure having you on the show. The The hour just goes by like this. And uh, I, I really hope you've had a good time too, uh, sharing your knowledge and your wisdom. I've certainly uh, absorbed a lot. And I think the straight talkers out there when they watch this show in the next couple of weeks will pick up loads from it and expect a um, a flurry of not just the book purchases, hopefully the, the, the paperback as much as the ebook. I'm a fan of paperback, as you can see, as you are. I do I do like to pick up the book. It's quite nice. And um, and of course, all of the, the foresight that you've given us around some of the things that we need to be thinking about. I think one of the things I haven't read the full book, I've read the summary, but I think I love the way you've laid out, you know, the Chipotle example, the KFC example, the state Starbucks, even Martha Stewart, even individuals uh, who've flipped around situations over a period of time, in no, no given time period, but over time have turned situations around, you know, catastrophes, crisis situations um, actually in their favor to a large extent. So I think one of the, thing, the other things I picked up was just because there's a crisis, it's not permanent. It's not like, this is it. This is the end. This is where we're finished. There's a way forward. There's always light at the end of the tunnel. And it's not to your point, another train. It could be a very, it's, it could be the way out. Um, as long as you're not too wedded to just the time period as to by when you want to do this. And I think working with someone like you is going to be a game changer to do that. Um, I've enjoyed today. Thank you so much. Before we go, uh, any sort of feedback or any initial responses around the last hour or so? How has this straight talk experience been for you? We'd love your input. We, we love all sorts of goods and constructive feedback so we can get better. Well, this has been a great, outstanding conversation. I really enjoyed the back and forth uh, that we've had. I think you had some great penetrating, insightful um, questions. And I hope my uh, responses uh, provided additional uh, insights and education uh, for both uh, for both you and your audience. And I would ask if people want to learn more about my background, more about my book, uh, please don't hesitate to go to my website. That's publicrelations.com. That's publicrelations.com. You could learn more about the book, uh, links to order the book, or to learn about myself or contact me if uh, your audience members want to continue the conversation and uh, how I can help them the days ahead. But uh, I've had a great time, and uh, you're a great interviewer. And uh, this has just, just been one of the best conversations I've had about my book and about my background. And um, I have you to thank for that. So so thank you for a great time. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. It's uh, an honor. And I love the fact that you've got publicrelations.com. That's the winner. That's a jackpot. So uh, um, great having you on the sh show, Edward. And we look forward to having you again when you write your next book, of course. Or if, if you feel there's something burning in your uh, in, in, in your minds and you think it needs to be discussed and shared openly, then you're most welcome on Straight Talk. So with right. that, thank you very much, uh, folks. Please click subscribe on the, on the bottom right there and um, looking forward to catching up with you once again very, very soon. Uh, adios and do take care. Thank you, Edward. Thank you.